Okay, this is awesome. This is the seventh month in a row we've done this. Has, who, has anybody been to all of them? Me, okay, I've been to them. Brian, <laughs> or, the, or the six. So uh, this is an idea I had. We do something at our office every week, uh, or at least twice a week, where we have somebody come in that is influential, whether it's to the city, to the industry, or just uh, in general. And they talk to our office and uh, just give different perspective, and uh, everyone leaves educated and um, just with different insight. And so I thought it'd be cool to go and share the gifts that we do at our office. Um, with just the general public and with my group of friends and people that obsess over business, entrepreneurship, and the city. And tonight we've got one of my best friends, his name is Trey Bowles. And we met, I think in 2004, and Trey was one of those guys, like, like a lot of you, um, that just is, he's just a fascinating guy. And the way I normally would approach life back in the day is I would either be really jealous or I would not believe somebody. And he was somebody that I just didn't believe. And there was a lot of things that, he told me that he was doing, and I was like, yeah, right. Like, like Trey told me he like co-founded Napster. I was like, yeah, right. And then he would like show me. He's like, here's my login. And he did all these other things. And along the way, I, I learned that Trey is a serial entrepreneur, but he would build something with the intention to sell it, which I'm still uh, not in that mindset. But I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read his bio to you guys, and this is going to be a really fun, interactive uh, get-together. And you guys that are watching at home, I uh, encourage you to ask questions. So. Uh, Trey Bowles is the co-founder and executive chairman of the Dallas Entrepreneur Center, the co-founder of the Dallas Innovation Alliance, the co-founder and chairman of the Mayor's Star Council, an NACIE member, a governmental appoint and, a, and a governmental appointee, appointee. Trey is the co-founder and executive chairman of the Dallas Entrepreneur Center, where he recently stepped down of his role as, uh, as his role of CEO. At the deck, he led the strategy vision and drove the overall planning and development efforts of the DEC. Uh, Bowles co-founded and launched the Dallas Innovation Alliance, a public partnership to develop a smart cities initiative for the city of Dallas. Bowles is the co-founder and chairman of the Mayor's Star Council, which is created with the city of Dallas Mayor Mike Rawlings to engage culturally diverse and civically minded group of young professionals to make an impact on the city. Trey launched an entrepreneurship department at, the SMU, at SMU and the School of Arts, Meadows School of Arts, where he still serves as an adjunct professor. And most recently, Bulls helped relaunch the next stage of the startup, oh, I got a phone call, of uh, the Champions Network. This, this, listen, it keeps going. So look, here's the deal. Trey is a serial entrepreneur. He's a really good dude. He does it with Jesus in his heart. He is married with 17 children, and all their names start with the letter F. If you follow him on Instagram every Saturday, he does a hashtag donies with daddy which means he goes and takes his kids to get donuts. So Trey's going to share his story. I've got some questions, but before we get started, let's give him a round of applause. So, so, so lead it off. Tell us a little bit about your story and, and, and why you're sitting here today. I'm sweating. Well, thank you for reading my bio. Clearly, I hate bios because they, they make everybody sound like they're better than they actually are. Look at this. Yeah. You just texted it to me real quick, so obviously you've done it for you. So, <laughs> uh, my name is Trey Bowles. I am a serial entrepreneur, which means I am um, un unemployable and I like to just start things. And so my whole career, ever since I was in college, I would find something that I thought was interesting. I'd go figure out how to do it and build a business around it. And so um, at this point, I don't feel like I've ever worked a day in my life, which sounds cheesy, especially since I work about 17 or 18 hours a day. But, um, but that's, so that's what I do. So the first part of my career was building tech and media companies. Um, and then I got into the music business and built a couple music companies and then got into... Um, but like, shed light on that too. Like there's musicians, like you guys heard of um, Ben Rector. Like this is who discovered Ben Rector. And Green River Ordinance. And who are the other people that you were part of the discovery process? We... I mean, but I mean, it's, it's legitimately fascinating because most people try to do one thing, do it well, and they, and they fail. But he's done all these random things. And there was like 15 years ago, I think Brady and I were the only ones who used to go. They used to do these acoustic shows at Knox Street Pub. And they bring these up and coming artists. And I'll never forget, I saw Ben Rector playing the lobby of the Ashton apartment complex. Yeah. And Trey's like, he's going to be really big. I was like, yeah, right. And he's gotten massive. He's great. If you've not checked him out, you should. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, I would just find, I mean, I, I was in Nashville, we, I did not co-found Napster, but I did um, run a company called Morpheus, which if you're old enough, you would remember it because it was one of the ones that everybody used. And it was sort of right time, right place. And we had uh, about 110 million people that signed up in the first year to use it. And so I just learned a lot about starting businesses and how to do that. It was um, my first, um, my first employees at Morpheus were three college kids and a high school kid. And at the end of the summer, they came to me and said, we're leaving. And I said, what did I, what did I do wrong? And they, 
this is nothing. I, we got to go back to school. <laughs> and I thought, crap, I don't know anything about sales. So I went and bought a book on sales and I read it and I built a sales team locally, nationally, and internationally. And we just kind of learned a lot of stuff while we did it. And so from, from that situation, I just went from opportunity to opportunity. I decided I wanted to live in New York, so I moved to New York and started a company in New York. But the way I got into the music business is I had a friend who was an artist in Nashville, and uh, he came in one day and said, hey, I just ordered my first, my first order of t-shirts. I was like, oh man, that's great, let me see them. And he showed them to me, and I was like, how many did you order? He goes, 3,000. And I said, there were 17 people at your show last week. How are you gonna sell 3,000 t-shirts? He's like, well, we got a volume discount. And I was like, no, 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 no. So we sat down and I became his manager and tried to help him figure out how to get in the music business. And then we started creating a, a booking agency so we could get him booked because you can't <clears throat> make any money in the music business unless you're touring. And so we just, everything we did, we learned um, by how we went. So when I moved to New York, um, I had a bunch of friends that were that worked for, for, for different television networks and I had this company I was building and I said, hey, how do you how do you get a show on TV like a reality show? And they said, well, you'd write a treatment. And so I started writing reality shows to help promote the technology company that I was building. And so we put some shows on TV and it was just, everything was just about like, like what shows? You guys are too young. Or, I mean, too old. a real world? Yeah, yeah, I did a ton of that one. But that's <laughs> <laughs> what was one that you did? Uh, there was one called Exposed, and it was really oh. interesting because. <laughs> cool. Yeah. 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 Was you it? were probably on it. it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, so one person would sit in a van, and the two people would go on the van. That's sounds good. Yeah. Hold on, somebody would sit in a van. And two people would sit, go on a date and they'd, have, they'd talk and the person in the van would be running the stuff through this technology that we had and would basically say, the guy's lying to you or the girl's lying or whatever the case may be. What channel was that? MTV. You no, remember this? It was on right after wow. Next. Remember Next? Next is, you remember Next? I don't. On the limit date? Yeah. yeah. Next was a great show. The Room Raiders. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You remember also Salute Your Shorts? No. All right, so uh, yeah, <laughs> keep going. No TV. Anyway, yeah. So that's been my background, and so I moved. I grew up in Dallas, um, lived in all these different cities, and then moved back from LA in 2008, and uh, ran a company here. We turned around and sold it, and I was like, well, what am I going to do? I well, the company was called it was GodTube, wasn't it? It's called GodTube. So YouTube, right as YouTube took off, and like like I told you guys, as a as a man of faith, they they struck on an opportunity and created a web-based video pl platform uh, website. For, for Christians, and was it Chris Christian that was behind it too? No, that was different. Okay, well, whatever. But GodTube was Trey. It was not my idea. I just came in to fix it because they had messed it up. But um, so we sold it, and then I was like, well, what do I want to do? I've lived in all these other cities. Where do I want to live? And so I started to evaluate. So I lived in New York. I lived in LA. I lived um, in San Francisco for a little bit, and then Nashville for a while. And I basically just looked around and said, look, all these cities are great, but no city has more opportunity and more potential than Dallas does now. And, uh, and I just got married and we had a kid, we had a house, our families were here, so I said, let's stay here. And so at that point, um, I ended up starting a, a department at SMU in one of their schools for entrepreneurship and, uh, and then launched this thing with the mayor. To, it's a young leadership development organization called the Mayor Star Council, which, which as he mentioned, the goal is to bring culturally diverse and civically minded uh, young professionals together who want to embrace and engage the city of today, not just inherit the city in 20 years. So I'd started a couple of these things and thought, well, gosh, I can't really go start a for-profit company now because these things would fail. So why don't I just do nonprofit stuff for a while? And so um, I was working with this guy um, who started a, a, a company called AOL, and he was launching this thing. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Say it again slower. Starting a company called what? He started a company called AOL. America Online. America. Yeah. You guys remember the, <laughs> Just like the song I just figure most people are too young to yeah, remember no, the, AOL, so the weird sounds. Yeah. Um, so you name drop. Anyway, keep going. <laughs> did I say his name? No, it didn't. Okay. <laughs> Would they know if I did? Yeah. I should have just said his name. And He's a Dallas guy. Can Austin, Austin, what's his name? No, his name is Steve Case. Yeah. So he had launched this thing from this nonprofit to help high growth entrepreneurs be successful. Um, and I was looking, and I was a part of it and helping do what was going on in Texas. And I was like, you know, I think there's not a place in Texas, specifically in Dallas, that helps entrepreneurs start, build, grow businesses. Why don't we test out 
a model to see if it works. And so we went to this company called SoftLayer, who was um, that year got bought by IBM for a couple billion dollars, and they had this space downtown or in the design district. And I said, will you give us your space for a year and let us test this out? And they said, sure. And so three months in, we had 10,000 square feet of space full of entrepreneurs. All, you know. And this is before like all this, the co-working space. Alexa, <laughs> lights on. Sorry, I heard a old comment. Sorry, I didn't find the device named lights. Okay. <laughs> so are we done? Okay. Yeah. This was before like shared workspace. Yeah, no, kind of no working stuff. Work um, and so we started to build this thing, and and it was this very corporate-y, like cubes every cube farm kind of feel. It was it was nothing about it was cool. But one of my favorite stories about it was we had a guy uh, who's got now got a successful business, and he was our first customer. And he was there before anybody else. So imagine, so I was in this office, there was 10,000 square feet of space, and I walked out of my office one day and he's sitting there at this cube. And he says, can you feel it? Can you feel it? And I looked at him and I looked to the right and there was 3,000 square feet of nothing. And I looked to the left and there was 7,000 square feet of nothing. And I was like, feel what? What are, you, what are you talking about? And he said, can you feel the entrepreneurial vibe in here? And I looked at him and I said, yes. I shut my door, went back to my office, and I was like, it doesn't matter what your space left looks like, it doesn't matter where you are, entrepreneurs can be entrepreneurs anywhere. You just gotta create the envir environment for them to be successful. So when this all started, I had this hypothesis. The hypothesis was that Dallas was the top five or six most entrepreneurial and innovative cities in the country. But I also believe that no one outside of Dallas knew nor cared. So the question was, how do we get people to care about the fact that all of this stuff exists and is happening and is here. And so my, my theory was we need to create something big and innovative like the few cities are, are, are in, the, in the country are doing. But if our goal is to bring the eyes of the world on Dallas to feature these innovators and entrepreneurs and, and we don't know where they are, then everything that we do is gonna kind of be a flash in the pan. So we launched the Dallas Entrepreneur Center to do a couple of things. One, to aggregate entrepreneurs that were already out there and to help aspiring entrepreneurs start building and grow companies more successfully. So if we could increase the funnel at the top and get more people to start businesses and we could increase the funnel at the bottom and get more people to be able to launch businesses because they're doing the right things, then we'll really be able to help this. And so we moved from our spot in the design district over to the West End, which was a sort of an unforgotten area of the city and thought what better way to rejuvenate an area of the city than to bring in a bunch of creative, innovative people and throw them in an area and just let them do what they do. And so about a year later, um, this is 09? This is, no, this is 2013 or 14. Um, a year later, we had, had 75,000 people come through the space. We had all this activity, all these people were getting involved. Um, different organizations were popping up around the region. And our, and our goal was really not to create an organization that was the center of anything at the focal point, but really was one of many organizations doing great things to help entrepreneurs. And so part of our job was to highlight what entrepreneurs were doing, what, what other co-working spaces and accelerators and incubators and educational institutions were doing because we wanted people to realize that Dallas and DFW was this huge hub of all the stuff going on um, to help entrepreneurs. So what we did at that point was we did this economic development survey. It sounds much more, um, scientific than I could ever explain. But what we found out from the survey was that in the last year, um, our space had had an economic impact on the city of about $135 million annually. So every year, what our space was doing was adding $135 million of impact to the city. So it told us, it taught us a couple of things. One, it said, what you're doing is working, we need to keep doing it. Two, um, this model could probably work other places in the country um, to help entrepreneurs in other cities. And three, and most importantly, if the economic impact of one 10,000 square feet floor in one building in one area of the West End, in one area of downtown of Dallas, has a $150 million economic impact, what would the economic impact be of all the organizations across North Texas? It would be in the billions. And so if there's billions of dollars of economic impact for startups. That's a that's a um, an, is a fundamentally powerful economic 
development driver, which means we could go to the state, we could go to the city, and we could basically say, look, you've got to put more effort and focus in driving entrepreneurship because this is a fundamental piece of what makes our economy drive. And so after we had done that, we kind of felt like we had started and got going. We started to expand and build locations across North Texas because we figured, you know, this is a big, huge area. There's 9,200 square miles in this region. Not every entrepreneur is going to, nor should he or she have to drive downtown to get support. So we built one in Addison called the Addison Treehouse. We built one in Denton called Stoke. Um, and then we built one in San Antonio. We built three in Southern Dallas. We just built a bunch of these spaces. Um, <clears throat> to help entrepreneurs wherever they were located, but we also did it very intentionally. We built one in an urban metropolitan area of downtown. We built one in a suburban one in, in Addison. We built one in a rural area of Denton, which if anybody's from Denton, they won't like that I'm calling it rural, but it's rural compared to downtown Dallas. And then we built one in southern Dallas, which is sort of the um, undertapped area of the city. And what that said was we can prove that the model works in all these different areas. So then we launched this new nonprofit that, so I mentioned Steve from AOL had built this nonprofit. He, it was a three year project, it was over. So we went back to him and said, look, we wanna build something on top of that that goes all around the country. So now we work with entrepreneurs from 49 states and, and Puerto Rico to help them build ecosystems like what Dallas and several other cities are doing. What state is it in? I forget, New Hampshire. Of course. Yeah, every time. <laughs> So if you know anybody in from New Hampshire that wants to be an entrepreneur, let, let us know. Um, and so I spent, I, and I told, at the time, I told my wife, I said, look, this isn't, probably it's not gonna work, but if it does, in five years, I'll stop doing nonprofit. And she was like, okay, do you get paid? And that was her only question. Um, and I said, not very much. And she said, okay, five years. And so we built that, and then we built this thing called the Dallas Innovation Alliance. So after we proved that the model was working with the deck, we went back to the city and said, hey, we need to build this smart cities project. And the reason that we wanted to do a smart cities project was because um, the, the influx of population into metropolitan areas by 2050 will overtake what the current infrastructure can handle. So you have two options. You can either send people out to live in the suburbs or you can make your current infrastructure more efficient. So we went to the mayor and said, look, we think this is something that we should do in Dallas. Uh, we think it's not a fork in the road that the city can decide they want to do or not. It's a dead end. So if we do it five to seven years before the city would do it, this could actually create billions of dollars of economic development and impact. It would be great. And so he passed us along to the city manager, who passed us along to the chief information officer, and we built the fastest to market smart cities project in the world, going from concept to in the ground in 10 months, and just and did a year-long pilot project with AT&T and a bunch of other people. Is this in the West End? Yeah. And then launched something called the Dallas Innovation District. And Well, tell me a little bit. I mean, I remember when you came to our office last year, people really paid attention when you said this, but from what I remember, the West End essentially is like all, it's like free Wi-Fi and just like like stuff that you literally haven't seen in, a, in, a, in an American city. But maybe explain a little bit about what you did to where it's going to eventually grow to the rest of our city and right. just give us a, a leg up. Um, just so, from a technology standpoint. So there's lots of cities that are doing innovation districts. Most of them go in and write a check for a couple hundred million dollars and they build it up and they, and they make it really sophisticated and really cool. Our city wasn't yet in a position that they wanted to do that, so we just went out and started building it ourselves. What the result was, um, was that hundreds of millions of dollars have now been put into the West End, specifically from institutional capital who have come up and bought buildings. So Granite Properties bought the old Weston Marketplace, Crescent bought some buildings, uh, Lincoln bought some buildings, and so all of those buildings have gotten bought up and they're being redeveloped for creative space. If you're in real estate, commercial real estate, that's the only thing people talk about now is creative space for startups. Um, so they're sort of doing that down there, but what, it, what it's done is it's rejuvenated. They're putting money back in, fixing these companies, fixing these buildings out, making these buildings more efficient, more effective. And then what we did was tested a bunch of technology solutions, right? Smart lighting, smart parking, smart, smart water metering, smart pedestrian tracking. So one of the things that we did was probably the most practical is we went in and we basically said, look, we know who's in the, we know when people are in the West End and where they are in the West End. So we went to all the bars and, and um, restaurants and said, we want to give you this information. So you know when to create your specials, when to go out and do different things and where to go out and do it. They've seen a 12% increase in revenue year over year, which they attribute to the, the 
pedestrian tracking information. It's not fully, you know, because of that, but that's a component of it. So what we did was we took this technology piece, which people are so scared about, and made it practical at a local level, at a citizen level, at a business level. And so we continued to do all these different kinds of project, projects. Well, what we were able to learn from that, those projects were, well, gosh, if you did these sorts of things, it could save the city lots of money, right? And if you did these sort of things, it could make the city lots of money, which would free up um, money that's, that's not there right now to do other projects. And so one of the last things we just announced was that we're building a, they're building a park in the West End that's going to be called the West End Square, and it's going to be a smart park. And as a, as a smart park, we're building in a lot of these tools that exist and are there, but we're also, we also have this whole area called Innovation Arcade where we can feature and showcase different innovation technologies, solutions, and things like that. Um, so we can do that with big companies, but we can also do that with startups. Everything that we've done in the West End has not just been about how do we feature corporations, but how do we find emerging technology companies, emerging entrepreneurs, and create a way for them to put and create their technologies in this space because realistically corporations can effectively innovate. Early stage companies can, but early stage companies aren't sustainable and corporations are. So if we can bring those groups together and we can help innovate on the startup side, connect that with the sustainability of a large company side, that creates long-term sustainability and value. Is that what you wanted? No, I, that I, too, I, I just haven't taken a breath now. Like, so <laughs> maybe just like digest or uh, interpret that for everyone. Like in short, what have you done? The trade developed for West End? No. <laughs> <laughs> what we did was we basically, so when I decided I want to live here, I was like, look, if I'm going to live here for the rest of my life, I want to do two things. I want to help entrepreneurs not make all the mistakes I made when I started my businesses. And two, I want to make Dallas a better city. And when I looked at how I could make Dallas a better city, I'm not a banker, not wasn't a real estate person. I wasn't in traditional businesses. I was a dot-com tech guy. I said, well, what I can do is help make Dallas more innovative and showcase what makes Dallas different, what makes Dallas better, and not the standard stuff, not the cost, the great cost of living, or the fact that we don't have state income tax, or we don't have all these sorts <laughs> well, of- Well, highlight though, like throw out some hard, cold hard facts that you guys probably don't know, and we didn't know until last year, but like what is Dallas now at the forefront of, or what is Dallas the only one of that we can go take home with us and- Well, Dallas use? is the number one, uh, city in the country for like 10 years in a row to have to own a business um, by CEO magazine. Um, it was ranked a couple years ago as the number one place in the country to have a business by the US Chamber of Commerce. Is, and and, um, and uh, one of the most interesting current things was we went up for this Amazon um, um, bid. And, uh, and so we were, the New York Times, or the Wall Street Journal called us third in that race, which I think is incredible because we didn't really want to win, because if you win, you've got 25,000 jobs. Can you just turn on my room bar? Maybe if you want to just click it with your foot. Will, can I plug it? This house is a mess. We like ghosts. Trade developers. Trade the room bar. Um, but the value of being ranked third in the country as what Amazon's looking at. So if if we would have won and 25,000 jobs or 50,000 jobs would have come here, it would have, it would have been awesome in one sense, but it would have ruined our economy too because all the people that work at Microsoft and all the other cool companies, Nokia and Ericsson and Capital One, all would have left to go to Amazon because Amazon seems cooler. And, um, and they would have left this huge void at all these other companies They would have to go out and hire people, which may, we may or may not have the, the current um, talent to be able to, to do that. But when you when you come out as number three, every company in the country that's looking to move now looks at Dallas. And so there's been a huge influx of companies that are coming here to look at look at this area. It's much, are you making fun of me? Up here, my dog's fighting up there. It's a, it's a lot going on. Um, we now have, we're now seen as a, as a potential hub for innovation and for tech talent and things like that. And so, those sorts of things become really valuable. Now that we're the fastest to market smart cities uh, project in, in the country, people start to look at us from that perspective. People start to look at the fact that we've got um, more and more um, startups coming out of here and capital growing out of here. The biggest problem that we have as it relates to capital, so if, if you look at Austin, 
Austin does about 600 to 800 million a year in early stage capital, right, from VCs. Um, Dallas ranks somewhere between 400 and 600 million. The problem is the, a good portion of the capital that comes into entrepreneurs and startups in Dallas comes from the family office side. The family office side doesn't report the money that they're putting into these businesses. So realistically, Dallas is somewhere in the realm of a billion dollars more than, than is being reported, but because we don't talk about those things and we don't talk about those wins, that doesn't get reported. And so it seems like Austin is a much more um, sophisticated, technology-driven city. When I think Austin's great, I think all of Texas is great, and we need to focus on all of Texas. But when people ask me about Austin, when you think about it, I say it's a great little city. It's a great little town. You know, if I want to go out, a cute little place. yeah, I go to Sixth Street. That's fun. But it's not Dallas. It doesn't compete with the huge amount of industry we have here, all the different organizations, all the different industries and focuses that we have. You know, Microsoft's second largest um, um, outlet in the world is in Dallas. Nokia uh, has a huge presence here. Ericsson's North American headquarters. Toyota's headquartered here for North America. I mean, there's story after story after story of that kind of stuff happening. That's real business. Those are businesses that drive our economy. They're, they're um, blue chip stocks, their core, that what what makes our economy run, and those businesses are here. And so, the more we can connect early stage businesses with those businesses, the biggest opportunity we have to be successful moving forward. Is that right? That's, hey, listen, hey, you're the boss. I, I want to I want to go over a couple questions that we had. I'm going to tell you guys a fun story. Trey, I, I'm a typical entrepreneur in the sense that I don't know if uh, planning is one of my gifts. And then at 5:43, they Trey texted me. Uh, Hey, is there anything in particular that I need to be prepared for to talk about tonight? And I called him, I was like, yeah, just send me some questions. And I already forgot, I told him that. And an hour later, he goes, question, when did you know you want to be an entrepreneur? And I texted him back, age four. <laughs> and he said, what are some mistakes you've made and what are the three most important characteristics of an entrepreneur? I said, making decisions too quickly. And I said, resilience, faith, and humor. He goes, no, these are the questions I want you to ask me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so with that being said, uh, what did you know you wanted to be an entrepreneur? <laughs> I thought in my, in my like narcissistic head, I was like, oh my God, this is going to be a surprise and y'all are going to ask me questions. <laughs> so when did you know that you wanted to be an entrepreneur? I think after I started my third company, I was like, oh, I might be an entrepreneur. Oh, wow, just drop that real quick. Okay, uh, and what mistakes, have, what mistakes have you made that you've learned from, from being an entrepreneur? So I make mistakes every day. No, but like really, like what uh, I was gonna get there, I was practicing. See, but mine was making decisions too quickly, so I'm just trying to practice what I've <laughs> in response to you. Sorry, what, what mistakes have you learned So from? I think the, the biggest, the thing that an entrepreneur needs more than, than anything else is the one thing that he or she doesn't have and that's experience. And since you can't buy experience over the counter, you can gain it one of two ways. You can either earn it, which takes time, money, and a bunch of mistakes. Most of us don't have enough money to make all the mistakes that we're gonna make and still be able to launch our business. Or two, you can learn it, surround yourself with mentors and do things like that. So I would say some of the biggest mistakes I've made have come out of a couple things. One, lack of experience in something. Two would be arrogance and just thinking that you can't fail, and that you're, you know, you're, you're the, per you're the person that can make these decisions. Not surrounding yourself with good people to help you make decisions. I always say that there's three types of leaders in the world, and I always do this when I describe our current mayor. I really like our current mayor. I'm sad that he's no longer going to be mayor. Um, you have leaders that ask everybody for opinions and don't listen to them and make decisions. You have leaders who ask people for opinions and they change their opinion every time they talk to somebody new, or you have leaders who ask for opinions, get all the information that they can, and then decisively make a decision. I think that's the, the mayor that we have now. But, but not doing a good job of surrounding yourself with people that can add those kinds of, those kind of pieces to your, to your um, decision-making process is important. And then most importantly, it's just operating, making decisions too fast, or operating too quickly, doing too many things at one time, you make a careless mistake, you do something like that that doesn't make sense. Um, and not recognizing that as an entrepreneur, especially as a, as a CEO, your staff doesn't think the way you do. And so 
Um, you often make mistakes in the way that you treat the people that work with you because you don't understand why they don't think about something the way that you do. And it ends up being problematic because what they wanted was a job and what you created was a life as an entrepreneur. Like you can't be an entrepreneur and not make this your life, right? It doesn't mean you can't have other priorities. It doesn't mean that your family has to come second, your faith has to come second. It just means people ask me all the time, so what are your hobbies? And I was like, oh, what do you mean? I don't have hobbies. If I'm not with my family, I am working and I love it. But those, those are the mistakes I make is when I start to, to not consider the, the, the personal priorities of my staff in the right way. Um, and now I'm, I'm not as, as bad as, it, as I was in the beginning because I've learned, because I've done it about a lot of times the wrong way, but those are mistakes that I've made. I also sent an email to a person one time <laughs> on accident telling her that I was going to get her fired. I was telling her boss that I was going to get her fired. Oh, that wasn't cool. That's how you know Okay, then what are the three most important characteristics of an entrepreneur? Okay, this, I like this one. So I think the three most important characteristics are courage. It takes courage to go out and actually try to build something, to put your, your soul and mind and guts and everything into launching a business. That takes a huge amount of courage. Most entrepreneurs end up being really scared that when they do that, that they put, I mean, it's like you're starting a company is like having a baby. Like this is your baby. And you're so worried that somebody's gonna tell you that your baby's ugly. And so I tell entrepreneurs all the time, that's easy. Lots of people are gonna say your baby's ugly. Your key is to find the people who think your baby's cute. And so getting the courage to do that is a huge characteristic of an entrepreneur. Second of all, and probably most important, is persistence. Um, when I ask the same question to some of the titans of, entrepreneurship that I've met in my life, most of them say persistence. And it's because once you actually have the courage to start something and start to do it, this is what being an entrepreneur looks like, especially as a startup, right? At one point in the day, you think, oh my gosh, we're gonna change the way the, the world works. And two hours later, you're like, oh crap, we're gonna run out of money next week. And so it's literally just like this, and so you have to be persis persistent. And so what over time, what I've been able to, to do a better job at is if, if the high, high, high is a 10 and the low, low, low is a zero, I stay at a seven. Mm -hmm. So the big wins, yeah, they make me happy. More often than anything, they make me breathe. And the lows, I'm like, well, now, this is a thing I tell people all the time too, is the worst thing that can ever, ever happen to you. The worst thing that can happen to you as an entrepreneur is that your idea doesn't work. That's the worst thing. And you can get okay with that. You've got the perfect scenario. Because you know what? Starting a business doesn't work isn't the worst thing that could ever happen to you. You can always just go back and, and get another job. So that persistence piece is really, really important. And then third, um, and equally as important, is that it takes a little bit of crazy. Because you have to be crazy to have the courage to go out and start something that 90% of the people that do it doesn't work. You, you're crazy. Because they, they don't work. I Somebody came to me the other day and he's like, Hey, I launched my business four years ago at the deck, and now this is what it's doing, and it's growing, and I was like, that's weird. He's like, what do you mean that's weird? I was like, well, it wasn't supposed to work. He's like, what, you didn't believe in me? You didn't think, no, I said, no, 90% of them work. So if I'm a betting person, I'm gonna bet a ton of money that every company that I see isn't gonna, start, isn't gonna work. But that's what, it takes that craziness, it takes that mindset of, well, why can't I make my company work? Why can't it be me? Why can't I fight through this and be persistent? And in the end, what happens most of the time, and if you ask any entrepreneur, and I think you know, Mark Cuban's no, um, no difference here. Mark Cuban, as I understand it, uh, blew a deal with uh, Microsoft for like 250 or $300 million to buy the company. Sitting in the office, the deal didn't happen, whether he blew it or whether he decided not to take it, whatever the case is, done. Can you imagine having a $350 million deal on the table and it not going, not happening? I mean, it would crush you. Five months later, he sold his company for $5.7 billion to Yahoo. Yahoo sold to Verizon a couple years ago for under that. His one company sold to, to Yahoo for less than all of Yahoo sold to Verizon last year. That is luck. 
right? So what you realize though as an entrepreneur is that true entrepreneurs that are really honest with you, with you will tell you if they hit it big, if something big, especially the first time, it's something happened that was lucky. Now luck doesn't happen to people that are sitting in their room sleeping all night not doing any work. Luck happens to people, what do they say it's at? The intersection of perspiration meets inspiration. A billion dollars doesn't fall out of the sky and land on your head. But if you are consistent and persistent and you're working, eventually, if it's gonna happen, it's some sort of luck strikes you and you take advantage of that. And what people like Mark and other people like that is they've turned that luck and capitalized in it and learned from it and they've gotten better. And the more you're an entrepreneur and the more mistakes you make, you don't remake, you're increasing your opportunity to be successful every time. So you kind of hinted at it, but what do you think the biggest mistake an entrepreneur could make would be? Not being persistent or um, not not open, opening themselves up to uh, mentorship, support, criticism, things like that. Because here's the thing, um, we as entrepreneurs can't afford to pretend like we know stuff that we don't know. So I always know an entrepreneur in the room because somebody says a word and somebody doesn't understand it, the entrepreneur goes, what's that word mean? Yeah. We'd all be like nervous and embarrassed about asking because we don't want people to think we don't know anything. Entrepreneurs are like, I don't give a crap, I don't have the time. I don't understand what it is you're saying, I'm gonna ask you because I gotta figure that out and we gotta go do it. And the other thing in And you, you kinda of look forward to the letdown. You kinda of look forward yeah. to the failure. Yeah, like not many entrepreneurs just hit a home runs from the very beginning mm -hmm. and, and kept it going. You kinda, you, you look forward to the failure and it, and it keeps you humble and it keeps you excited and it keeps you thinking about what you can do to go adjust because if you get used to it, then you fail. Right, you know? Um, okay, a question you had on here too is home address. Oh, that was for, <laughs> that, you did that. Uh, okay, who, uh, what's the most successful story to come out of the deck? Or in, in, anybody that you've mentored, anybody you've played a part of, what, what's, what's been your home run, your unicorn? Uh, so, I mean. That came from one of our fellow entrepreneurs in the room. So what I would say is this. I would, first of all, I would say on, entrepreneurship, and what we, the way we look at it at the deck is that on, success is how you define it, right? So, um, so it is, it is erroneous to expect somebody that they have to build a company and sell it for a billion dollars to be a successful entrepreneur. Let's say you have a business and you're selling you know, cake balls out of your, the back of your car and that makes you happy and you're, you're feeling content and fulfilled with that, that's success. So there are lots of success stories that have come out of the deck. There's lots of success stories that I have seen and been a part of. The, the one that you probably would know about is there was a company called Rise Air which does membership-based um, jet charter service between Dallas to Austin, Dallas to Houston, Dallas to San Antonio. That started out of the deck, a guy named Nick Kennedy, and he sold that company to Surf Air, which is a group out of California. Nick is an incredible entrepreneur. He's, he's done a lot of great things. Um, that, was a, that was a big win. Um, we, you know, we, we worked, I mean, the, the benefit of the deck is that the deck, we had certain people that officed inside the deck and worked in the deck, but we also had a lot of different people that we were able to help support that didn't office there, but were um, that we were able to help make connections from a capital perspective, from a PR perspective, from a customer perspective, and so um, you know, so those, so what, so I've seen successes that we've gotten to be a part of in different ways, but love um, more than anything to see those those companies succeed and um, the. So what's the craziest one? craziest idea or the craziest oh. um, that's an interesting question that wasn't on my list you know I've seen I've seen companies that have come in and, and, and had and I won't get into names most but, interesting story sorry you have uh, had. so I do have an interesting an interesting entrepreneur Here story we go. Okay. <laughs> so now we're back by the way, fun story. You guys remember those T-shirts I did a long time ago that said Roger Skeely is my realtor? Mm -hmm. That was Trey. You know, it was Brad. And Brad. But Trey printed those T-shirts. I thought you were going to say those 3,000 T-shirts you bought them that's what you printed my shirts. <laughs> that was, yeah, seriously. Those were really great. I yeah, mean, that was my splash. Are, yeah. That was a, it was a brilliant. What I did was I told a friend of mine in Nashville, and he did the same thing, and it was awesome. He, he was huge. I mean, we would go to the like when, when I was young, like the places that all the cool kids would be, and there would be Roger Tilly's My Realtors t-shirts everywhere. Like, I was like, this is, it was Brad's idea, so let's be Brad Alessi. That's what yeah. I did with the printed shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy story, man. 
So um, this sort of speaks to the concept of like how do we determine success. So when I did this Morpheus thing after it was over, we got sued by all the record companies and all the rec and all the movie studios and everybody and stuff. And so after we won the lawsuit, I was like, okay, I'm I'm out. I'm not really interested in stealing people's content, especially since my other job was helping my friends who were building content actually monetize it. So I went in, uh, over to Europe and walked around for like four months and. I met up with these guys who we were partnered with um, at Morpheus, and it's a company called uh, Kazaa. And if you guys remember Kazaa or Kaza, however people pronounce that, then. so we sit down, we have this conversation, and the guy and the guy says, he basically says, "Look, we're launching a new studio company, and this is what we're doing." And I was like, "Yeah, well, here's the problem: nobody's going to use that technology for at least three years. That's the dumbest name I've ever heard for a company." And three, you're going to get sued because it still allows people to do copyright infringement. Um, and the funny thing was, I was right on all those things. Nobody used the technology for three years. Nobody even knew what VoIP technology was. Um, the name was dumb, and uh, and they and they and they did get sued. But at that point in my career, I was like 22 years old, and I thought three years was a really long time. The first company I worked for. That a friend of mine bought sold for thirty million dollars in less than eight months in the dot com boom. The second company that I worked for that I that I ran had one hundred and ten million customers. I, like I just thought, literally, the job I applied for after Morpheus was to run MTV's internet division, and I was shocked that they didn't want to hire me to do it. Not because I was arrogant, but but I was like, what? But this, I don't. Why wouldn't I? You know, I'm ready to do this, and they're like, you're twenty two years old, and I didn't know. So that company, interestingly enough, started, and I was not the third partner, um, and it grew, and it sold for $3.5 billion to eBay. And then a couple years later, it sold for $1.5 billion to a private equity fund, and in 2014, it sold for $10.5 billion to Microsoft. It was called Skype. So you look, so you, it's, it's, so you look at a story like that, and you think, Oh my gosh, you should be a billionaire right now. You should be a billionaire, you should be living in San Francisco, you should be doing this sorts of things. And I look at it like, okay, I mean, I don't view it as a mistake, right? Because if I wouldn't, if I would have done that, I wouldn't have the amazing, beautiful wife that I have now, I wouldn't have the three kids that I have now, I wouldn't be living in Dallas, the greatest city with the most potential of anything in the world, and I'd probably be a prick, because I'd be a billionaire that didn't care about anybody else. <laughs> not that I'm yeah, not a prick, prick now. Yeah. Yeah, okay. You wouldn't be in um, this room, in this wicker chair, in this the house. Point, the point yeah. is, you can't view the decisions you make in life as mistakes, like or missed opportunities, because that's not what, and at that point, at 22, I completely changed the way I viewed success. But when, you kind of wish you were still part of Skype when it's old. I, I wouldn't mind having a million dollars, but but the point being, I changed the way I viewed success because before I thought, when I was running Morpheus, I was like, if I can make a million dollars by the time I'm 30, that's success. A million dollars by the time, can you imagine having a million dollars by the time you're 30? Then I realized a million dollars isn't that much money and you can't live off a million dollars for the rest of your life. Second of all, I realized we built Morpheus, which was the fastest growing company in the history of the internet and we didn't sell it for a billion dollars. So I started to say, well, gosh, how much can I really control the outcome of my companies? I mean, I can control if they grow, I can, I can control my contribution to the process, but I can't control who's gonna buy it, if somebody's gonna buy it, what they think about it. And so I said, well, rather than putting my focus on an end result, which I can't control, why don't I put my joy, my contentment, and my satisfaction in just contributing to the process, and it completely changed the way I viewed everything. Obviously, because I'm a person of faith, and I believe that when you die, you go somewhere forever. The 80 or 90 years I spend on Earth doesn't really matter, so why not think about my perspective as it relates to the fact that I'm not gonna be here forever? So the things I do, how can they help other people? Um, the things I can do, how do they bring joy and contentment? How do they create opportunities for me to serve other people and give to other people? and create happiness in other people. That's much more valuable than um, a, a billion dollars that you may have. I mean, you, so often the people who have the most money are the people who are the most unhappy. And so what it did was it just changed my perspective as, as a young age as to what success looked like. And the blessing for me has been
That's the way I've looked at it ever since. So it means that I can go out and do anything I want to do. As I said before, I've never worked a day in my life, but when I go out and do what I want to do, I'm happy about it and I'm not judging my success by whether or not you think I should have gone and worked for Skype or whether you think I should have launched the deck as a for-profit rather than non-profit. What I'm worried about is success in my own mind. And if I'm successful in my own mind, that's all that matters. And that takes a huge burden off of you to have to worry about what other people think or how do you judge yourself versus other people or how do you determine whether or not you've got enough money this year to you know, to be happy or to be successful. Throw that out the window and just focus on your contribution to the process. Yeah, that was an honor. Thanks for listening. What questions do you guys have? No less than how did you get the <laughs> hotel to agree with you to have all the people downstairs? Because I went one time and it was packed with people. And I was wondering what's going on. So how did you get them to agree to be able to do something like that? Which place? West End. In the West End, yeah. We had a place. How did we get them to let that many people be there? How did you get them to agree with you? Do you guys own the building? Or are we thinking of two different things? We leased the building. Leased them, okay. Okay, so you leased it and then you just make that. Yeah, so we leased it and we had two, for a while we had two floors in this one building and we could use those floors however we wanted. Okay. And so we would host events there and sometimes people, people would work there. It was like a co-working space as well as an event space. And so that's how we had all those people there. Who else has questions? If anybody, anybody on there? That's a great question. Several things. Like what? <clears throat> I'm trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up, which is what I've been trying to figure out since I was 20. Um, so there's, you know, I, I'm tend to be interested in markets that are on sort of on the cutting edge of being new. A part of the reason that I do that is because if you're in a new market, people argue with you less because they don't understand it. Um, and so whatever you think is going to happen, you tell them and they tend to go, okay. And then once they start to understand a the market, then they start to pretend like they can argue with you because they, they want to make it seem like they understand. So think about cryptocurrency and cybersecurity and blockchain. Like, Eventually we're getting to the point where you guys, where all of us understand what that is and then we'll argue with each other. Well, right now, most of us don't understand what it is, and so somebody comes in and says, blockchain is this, this, and this, and you go, got it, that's cool. <laughs> so, so that's sort of the areas that I'm working in. I'm spending a lot of time, the things that fascinate me are smart cities, mm -hmm. um, opportunity zones as it relates to um, alternative investment strategies, not just real estate, but how do you take um, investments and diversify the, that investment into businesses creating jobs for people that it's supposed to create um, and I'd like to help on yes last week we launched a new incubator for smart cities companies so I think so I obviously still want to help entrepreneurs but whatever I do next is going to be for-profit rather than non-profit I promise my wife and I've got two girls that probably will want to get married at some point, three kids that will probably want to go to college, so I gotta pay myself sometime. So, so when you, uh, I love everything you do with the deck, I was a big beneficiary of it, especially like OG and the Dallas Startup Students, appreciate that. Um, Pre-WeWork, which is what the deck was, um, now seeing there being more and more co-working places, when you have venture-backed co-working, like what WeWork is, uh, where they don't have to have seen and heard from a lot of other different co-working places, I don't, you probably have even more data on this than I do, um, that it's difficult for local, non-venture-backed uh, co-working places to survive. So, setting that up, uh, do you think something like WeWork is good for local communities? It, de it depends. If you're an independent co-working space, it's probably not good for you. But is Walmart good for local mom-and-pop you know, shops? Is Home Depot good for Ace Hardware and places like that, it's probably good for the people. It's not good if you run a company that does that. I think in a perfect world, um, you know, the idea is that we would all support each other and create opportunities for those things to exist. But, um, you know, WeWorks and the 50 other ones that are in town right now, um, we haven't tapped the market in terms of how much space, how many entrepreneurs and how many creative businesses that are out there that would be interested in renting space for co-working. 
but it's difficult when somebody comes in and puts three million dollars into their TI versus the forty-five thousand you put into your TI. Um, it makes it difficult to compete, um, and so it, it is hard. But it's a reality. So you can embrace WeWork and 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 believe that they want to help participate and be a part of the of the community and, and offer good stuff. But they're going to do it on their terms and make sure that they're able to you know, build the market in the in, in the, the community that they are. Um, what the deck did and other organizations like that that I think is important is that the idea of we focused on three main things at the deck: education, mentorship, and community. Community is really, really important. Community is difficult to do in an environment that's corporate, in an environment that's <coughs> easy backed and no balance sheet regulated. And so we started as a nonprofit specifically because we wanted our premier focus to be the success and fulfillment of the entrepreneurship, to the, the entrepreneur's vision. Um, we did that knowing that we were going to have to go out and raise extra money to be able to stay around. Um, that's not WeWork's model, um, but doesn't mean that WeWork's bad. It, it's a good thing, but I still think we need, uh, I think what we have to do is shift the model a little bit and say, okay, well, if your goal is to help entrepreneurs be successful, maybe you don't run your own spaces anymore, or maybe you don't run your spaces in the same way that you did, but you work on programs and focus systems. So the deck's going to be coming out with several programs that are, that's going to happen across a bunch of different co-working spaces because we recognize that the value that we can offer entrepreneurs is that education, mentorship, and community. The deck was never about being a co-working space. There just wasn't co-working spaces that we started and people need spaces to work. So we did that, but we've also begun to evolve. We partnered with this group out of Austin called Capital Factory to build one of our locations. We still have seven or eight locations around town, but that one we thought was important to partner with a group out of Austin that wanted to come to Dallas because they were gonna bring more money in for startups. We relaunched our location in the West End to focus on uh, uh, accelerators, incubators, and investment groups. So RevTech moved back down in, into our space downtown. We're launching this incubator. You, you've got to constantly be willing to evolve for the needs of the marketplace. And if we work in other places like that can create a space for people to work, then that's great. We need to still create the programs that help make those organizations be successful. Thank you. Did I answer your question? Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. You first. Um, just talking about your faith, have you ever made a business decision that was maybe more like faith-based and where you felt like God was leading you rather than like business that's a great, logic? That's a great question. So um, when I came back to Dallas, I always, Dallas is my home base. So wherever I lived, if I was ever in between, I left a company, I would come home and live at my parents' house <laughs> until I was 30, 20-something. Um, and so a friend of mine called me one day and he said, hey, um, I'm working at this company called GodTube. I want you to come run marketing. Well, my first company that I was a part of was called MusicForce.com. It sold Christian CDs online. I spent a bunch of time working with in the Christian, for-profit Christian community. And my experience has been that there are a few people that are less competent and more unethical than Christian for-profit businesses. So he calls me and says, I want you to come run marketing at GodTube. And I said, there is no way in hell I'm going to work at a company called God to. Like, this is everything I hate about Christianity. Like, it's a copycat version of YouTube, which YouTube works and is cool, but we're going to, we're going to, it's like God milk, God Jesus. Like, everything we do, we rip off things that are cool and make jokes out of them, and which makes jokes out of us. And so I was like, no way, I'm not working there ever. Like, thanks, but no thanks. I would rather go live under a cardboard box than in Africa than work for a company called GodTube. And he was like, okay, well, pray about it and let me know what you think. So I went and met with 25 different people, private equity guys, um, VCs, old friends, uh, mentors, all from all different areas. And I, I said them all the same thing. Oh, this I'm looking at these three different things. One of them, this thing is GodTube. 25 people said the same thing to me take the job. Not, oh, that's cool, you should consider that. Not, oh, I like that idea, You maybe you should look at that. They all said the same exact three words, take the job. So two weeks later, I'm sitting in GodTube as the head of marketing at a company that literally next to living under a, a cardboard box in Africa, that would have been my second worst choice. And what happened through that was I didn't change my opinion of 
Christian for-profit businesses. In fact, it just further solidified what I thought about them, which is sad. Um, I don't think Christian business people are bad. I think that Christian for-profit businesses tend to be less competent and un more, more unethical in nature, and I have 472,000 stories to support that. But through that, we went through this process. I was, I was head of marketing. We spent, oh, I apologize. I'm not angry. <laughs> I still love Jesus. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, we spent, they spent a bunch of money in one year, and they, we had raised like 20 million bucks gone in one year. All of it. Jesus? No. <laughs> and so after it was over, the, uh, a friend of mine was running the company. He left, and the board came to me and said, hey, we want you to run this company. And I was like, well, this is easy. I've shut down a lot of companies in the dot-com world. I can shut this thing down. I said, but if, if you're gonna let me run it, then I've got some ideas that I've been suggesting for a while, maybe, maybe we try those. And they said, okay. And I said, then let me be clear with you. If you have the same problem with me that you had with the previous CEO, and you don't <clears> listen, <throat> and you don't support me, and you don't do this, I'm not gonna argue with you. I'm gonna close my laptop, I'm gonna walk out the front door, I'm never gonna come back. And they said, okay. So I said, let's try some stuff. And so we tried some stuff, and the first thing we did was we fired 90 people, which is not the good first step of a new CEO. Um, and then we started to try to generate revenue because we'd never tried to generate revenue before. So we went, anyway, we went through this whole process. Two years later, we sold the business. Um, and I, it was probably one of the greatest professional learnings of my life, and I learned a lot about people, I learned a lot about management, I learned a lot about negotiation and structure, um, which I never would have gotten had I not listened to what I felt like was God telling me to take the job. It's the only time I've ever felt like he said, take the job. But there was a clear reason in hindsight why he gave me the opportunity to do that, and that's Do you feel like in your personal experience, the most of the time people invest, they invest in you or your idea? So I think investors invest in three things. They invest in the concept of the idea, they invest in the team, and they invest in the ability to execute, which is directly tied to the team. And so, um, so yes, I think that it is ex exceptionally important to have a good team. One of the biggest mistakes that entrepreneurs make is in hiring people. So this is what I tell entrepreneurs all the time. If you are the best at more than one thing in your company, then you hired poorly. Right? So if you're the best at marketing and you're the best at finance, you didn't hire well. If you're the best at nothing in your company, you hired brilliantly. Because what you have to think about is not, people always used to ask me when I, was, when I played sports, they would be like, oh, are you the guy that wants the ball at the end of the game? Like I played, I played football at a very small college, but I played football in college. USC. And they were like, yeah, you see. Um, you want the ball at the end of the game. And my question was always like, of course I want the ball, but am I open? And they're like, what do you mean? I was like, well, if there's two people on me, then somebody else is open. So you've got, as an entrepreneur, you've got to think like a coach, not the, like a star player. And the best decision you can ever make is hiring people that are 10 times smarter than you because they just make you more money. So that's what you should be doing. And so the team is exceptionally important when you're looking at raising money um, because if you are able to build a good team or surround yourself with good uh, board members or mentors, I have a friend in town who raised a bunch of money because there was a guy on, a bo on his board that was a big deal. And they said, well, gosh, if this guy's on your board, <clears throat> you must be doing something right, so we'll put the money in, right? So it's exceptionally important um, because you also know as an investor that if you have a team that's been successful and done a lot of good things, then they've made a lot of mistakes that they're not going to make again. And so I think it's exceptionally important. Thank you. For my opinion. What else you guys got? Cool. So you mean a lot to me, man. This is this is fun. I asked him, he bailed on me last month. So Blake Wiley, I'm glad that you could kind of betray me. <laughs> oh, I forgot. So, um, yeah, there, you've done a lot for our city, and a lot of people in here are real estate fans and just fans of, of the house in general, and they don't realize the impact. When you came to speak to our office a, a, a year ago, there's a lot of things that you made mention of that I didn't even know, but people were instant fans. So hopefully you guys that are watching tonight, you guys that are in this room, can appreciate the impact you've had and i um, excited about the future impact. He's getting his real estate license, too. He forgot to mention that. So um, he's been doing some 
some big stuff behind the scenes. But um, yeah, I appreciate you doing this and, and being here. And Kyle, it's twice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, man, thanks, thanks for thanks for being a part of this. If anything you want to close it out with, please do. Um, if not, we'll be seeing you soon. I, my, this is my vote for mayor by the time we're 50. Okay, and, I, and I've called this with him for the last decade. And people just have different leadership gifts, and, and Trey is just a natural leader that you believe him. You believe him, and he's got sincerity behind it, and he's got the kind of people that are going to go back him. So you heard it. You heard it here first, uh, you know, o online or in person. You're going to be mayor of this town. He's like, I can't. And now he's just like, okay, I'm going to do it. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, anything you want to close out with? I, not, we'll, we'll, I think I would say, you know, a couple <clears> things. <throat> as it relates to entrepreneurship, you should go try it. Like, the worst thing that can happen is doesn't work. The yeah. worst thing that happens, the best employee in the history of the world is a former entrepreneur, because nobody understands the importance of payroll more. Nobody understands the importance of leadership, the importance of accountability, the importance of people doing, I mean, it, an, a failed entrepreneur is the best employee you could ever have. But go try it, it's the worst thing that can happen. Second of all, I would say, in whatever you do, if you manage people or if you run a business or whatever it is, you've got to focus on um, looking at how you can better equip and empower your employees to reach their personal and professional goals. If, you're, if, you're, if your employee leaves your company at the same level that they entered it, you did not do your job. And your job as a manager or as a CEO or as an entrepreneur is to invest in those people and elevate those people to offer positions of opportunity. As it relates to the two more, as it relates to the city um, of Dallas, you've got to recognize at some point that it is your responsibility for what the future of our city looks like. I tell my young professionals in the mayor star council, if the if Dallas sucks in 20 years, it's your fault because this is no longer your dad's city, this is no longer your grandma city. The responsibility of the future of the city is on us, and so if you don't stand up and do something to make a difference in that. Then, um, then it's on you. So I will invite you to the Mayor Star, and I say this because I'm not the CEO of Mayor Star Council or anything anymore, but we have this event called Engage Dallas on March 8th. It's a full day of showing people how to learn about the city, how to connect with the city, how to serve in the city. President Bush and um, Mayor Rawlings are kicking off the day with the fireside chat. We're doing a mayoral candidate forum, so you, most of you probably don't even know who's running for mayor, but there's nine of them, and we're gonna have them all come there. We're gonna ask them things that are important to young professionals. I would encourage you to come to that. It's an awesome way to begin to learn about the city. When I moved back here, I didn't know anything about our city, nothing, which is part of the reason I started that. Um, and the last thing I would say is, I had it, just give me one second. It'll, okay. it'll come back. Um, Um, so, care about the city is the, is the second thing. Um, That's not the last thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. It was there. I get talking. I get excited. But How do we find out about that event? Engage Dallas. Go to mayorstarkcouncil.org or Google Engage Dallas 2019. I'm sure that it'll lead there. And it's cheap. We, we left tickets at 75 bucks because we wanted to make sure that anybody could go to it. It's a day long thing and it's I can brag about it because it's not I didn't create it. It's somebody in, inside of the mayor star council did. Um, the the last thing I, I would say is really especially in the in the and this is not what I was gonna say, but it's something different. Yeah. So I just pulled it out. Yeah. Maybe it'll come. Um gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I haven't been a god to for like eleven years. <laughs> but I think it still exists. Um, so the other thing that I, you keep making me forget this stuff. <laughs> um, oh, got it. Okay. Um, my favorite quote that I've ever heard is this. Um, and, it, and it's been done by a lot of people. I think uh, Henry David Thoreau did it. I know that uh, a couple of presidents said, pre president said it. But um, basically what, what the quote is, is that it do if it doesn't matter who gets credit, there's no limit to what can be accomplished. And so one of the things you gotta think about is, um, and the, one of the things we've tried to do in the, in the entrepreneur community, and everything I do is share the credit because the reality is, it's not you. You listen to the, that stupid bio, and that's lots of people participating in things that I tended to be at the front of 
the, the front of the line. Leadership is not standing at the front of the line. Leadership is supporting and serving and giving because you know what, as a CEO, if your, your job is to serve the people that work for you because if you don't serve them and they're not able to do their job well, it's all gonna funnel up to you and you're gonna have to deal with it. And so when you think about um, sharing credit and recognizing that the thing that drives people is the idea that when they participate and they give and they support something, that they're actually appreciated for that. And, and I have seen in my career, specifically in the last five years in this nonprofit space, I have seen people that I've gotten to work with rise to positions of leadership and strength and growth, especially I get to work with like phenomenal women uh, entrepreneurs and, and women leaders. They're doing things that um, they hadn't been given the opportunity to, to do before because we've been oppressing women for so long and telling them that they can't play certain roles and can't do certain things. We're seeing women just explode in these leadership opportunities because they're phenomenal, and by empowering and creating that opportunity to do that, and encouraging and equipping, and doing those types of things, you have this huge opportunity to reach to reach levels of growth that you can never you never could. And as we look at the two most important things, I swear this is no, there's two more things. Thank you. The two. This is it's because I'm so. so can I give anybody a drink? I'm, yeah, you can give me one. So, <laughs> the two most important things that are, so Dallas is a great city. It's a, it's a good international city that has a great, that all this great stuff going through it. But there's two things that will prevent us from being a great international city. One is the lack of focus on innovation and how we can leverage, and innovation not in technology, but how do we create efficiencies to make sure we're constantly getting better at what we do and how we do it at a city level. And second is our commitment to equity as a city. We have the biggest, um, or the second biggest gap between the haves and the have-nots. And we have this huge thing called the Trinity River that separates two parts of the city, North Dallas and South Dallas, Southern Dallas. Southern Dallas makes up 60% of our land mass and 15, thank you, 15% of our tax base. And is, what? And as long as we don't recognize the importance of uh, taking a position on equity in our communities, we will not be a great city. Part of the problem with having inequity in your city is that it's wrong and horrible and bad that we would ever treat somebody as though they are not equal to us or that they don't add value. And that's not just ethnically, it's gender, it's age, it's political affiliation, it's religious affiliation. Like. The second part though, if you look at that, is the fact that what it really does is makes us a less dynamic community. If all we're doing is taking <coughs> to one particular generic, plain vanilla community, we're missing out on what would make us like a New York, or like a Los Angeles, or like a London, which is the diversity piece. And so those, if you think about how you can engage in the future of our city, and you think about those things, think about how you can affect the innovation component, or quotient, and two, how you can do your part to deal with the lack of equity that exists in our city because it's where we are today is not because of what happened last year or the year before. Where we are today is what's happened from 60, 70 years ago. And if we don't begin to make that change today, in 20 years, we won't, we'll always be a good city, we won't be a great city. If you wanted Dallas to be considered one of the greatest cities in the, in the world, those are the things that we need to address. So find what you're passionate about, go do it, and don't let anybody tell you you can't. And when you fail, just get up and try again because failure is nothing more than an education. Done. Shut it off. <laughs> Two more things. I <laughs> know, uh, for real, stop. Trey Bowles for mayor, 2030. <laughs> I'm not running for mayor, but let me know how I can serve you. Like if there's anything you guys are doing and or you're passionate about and you want to get plugged in and you're like, hey, I'm really, I think, you know, domestic violence sucks. What do I do? How can I get plugged in? There's people all over the city that will welcome your skill and your passion and your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's it. Cheers. Go get some pizza and talk to Trey. Thank you. <laughs>